Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And she's a Southern, passionate woman. And we were joking about how this thing of that we are probably a little on the loud side, you know, not <laughs> all the time, but, um, and that this thing of sort of trying to figure out what is the right volume for Zoom interacting with people <laughs> working in the house for the, I don't know. It's just been like a whole new thing to learn. It has been. So we are officially live. Um, this is Dyslexia Coffee Talk coming to you from a frozen Texas that is slowly, slowly calling out <laughs> with a very special guest today, Peggy Stern of Super Devil. Thank you, Peggy, for taking the time out today. I mean, shortly after your birthday, too, to like share some of your time with us. <laughs> My pleasure, and I admire you uh, dealing with frozen pipes around you. <laughs> time to do this, and all the incredible work that you and Dyslexia Initiative do. So it doesn't totally surprise me that you would somehow manage to show up because that's what you all do. Well, thank you very much. It's it's been a really interesting week, and I am. I have never looked forward to 100 degree temperatures as much as I do right now in my whole life. Yeah. yeah. So bring on the summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, let's let's talk about, you know, what sort of so you've created Super Devo. Let's talk about what Super Devo is. Let's explain that to people that might not have found Super Devo yet. So wh what is that? So for anyone who's listening, you can go to superdevil.com, which is a website, and you will come to a website that's devoted to social emotional learning for kids who learn differently. And, you know, I hope what we'll spend some time today is talking really about what does social emotional learning really mean. But I mean, I will be honest that when I started the project, I just saw it as I'm dyslexic, my daughter is dyslexic. I went through what I had to grapple with in the 60s, right? Mm -hmm. you know, I was identified very young, which was lucky because my grandmother was in the field. And there was Orton Gillingham all the way back then, which makes us realize, wow, you know, why has this taken so long <laughs> to get into the mainstream? But anyway, and so I got, I, my parents had the resources. My grandmother was an advocate and I got a, you know all the help to learn how to decode and read. But the lucky thing for me was that my tutor who I saw many times a week, it was like I went to school where mm -hmm. not great things were happening. And then I saw her after school was like Mary Poppins. And mm -hmm. she just knew how to try to make me feel good about myself even if I was struggling, make things fun and most of all, make me understand my strengths while I was dealing with what were obviously, you know, my weaknesses and things that were hard. So, you know, fast forward and I have a daughter who I'm watching both my kids with an evil eye. My eldest one doesn't have dyslexia though he had an anxiety um, disorder. So I was sort of all over that one and learned a ton. But, um, but Emma clearly, at an early age, I could see she had dyslexia. And so as I was able to get her, you know, as we all have gone as parents, figuring out in, you know, the public school was saying, oh no, we're not gonna do anything till third grade, it's too soon. You know, all the things that people have heard. I was acutely aware that I wanted her to have the same kind of confidence and sense of herself that I had been given by um, Dorothy, my tutor. So, that led me to start, you know, sort of looking and understanding more that really it was hit or miss if you get that, you mm -hmm. know? It's like there are incredible people out there and companies that are beginning to at least provide more intervention, not at the speed and, and breadth that we need it. But, yeah. um, but what I came to learn was that there really was beginning to be in education in general something about you know thinking of the whole child and in the 90s there had really been this term social emotional learning so this brings me back to what super devil is your question which is i didn't really know the term when i started i mean i to be honest i just knew that i wanted to help this generation of kids as they got identified 
or didn't, just were maybe struggling with learning, to have a place to go with a teacher, a parent, a tutor, whomever, where they would see other kids dealing with the themes that they were facing that had to do with either you know, feeling insecure or being bullied or not knowing how to speak up and have a way to talk about it and have a way to name it and a way to understand it. And so I ended up working with Marianne Wolf, um, which was, you know, incredible. And I saw your amazing interview with her. Um, and I hope I can, I mean, what I love about what Marianne can do is she breaks down the science, right? So yes. that we can try to understand really what is going on in the brain Mm -hmm. And why we cannot assume that anyone is going to necessarily read just because they were born, you know, that it's a complicated process and that it isn't something that is natural and it has to be learned. Well, what I think is interesting and what happened in my 10 years of developing Super Devil is that um, I got to work with Dr. Melissa Orkin, who um, helped uh, run Dr. Um, the Marianne Wolf Center at Tufts and, and other researchers who in a way were starting to say, well, look, we can't assume that kids also are going to naturally have resilience or naturally have what they call growth mindset, right? right. And which some teachers don't even know what that term that's why it means. Um, and parents, how would we know what that means, right? So we need to take the time to also as we're getting the intervention for our kids to become readers, we need to realize that we also have to help them with what are gonna be the skills that will make them succeed in school and in life all along the way as they continue to deal with being a different kind of learner. Because you will always be a different kind of learner. I'm just turned 64 and my dyslexia is you know, there in my life. Um, coming up in ways of directionality issues. And I follow my daughter when we go biking where we're, we're staying. And I'm like, you go first, Emma. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I still won't be the one who will be good at the, where do we go left? Where do we go right? So, you know, I think that um, for me, even the work of learning about these issues helped me even as an adult mm -hmm. um, to understand how I still wasn't always asking for help when I could have. And so that's the self-advocacy piece. Um, so the specifics of Super Devil is that we created short videos where all the actors are kids who have learning differences, which is mm -hmm. so cool. And the way that came about is that I'm a documentary filmmaker by trade. And so for me, it felt like, well, I don't think kids wanna watch documentaries. Like they don't wanna see kids saying, hi, I'm dyslexic, it's really hard. But sometimes I feel, you know, yeah. we knew we needed to make narratives and make it fun and make it, but I wanted it to be authentic. I wanted kids to believe it, like not to feel that grownups were talking to them. So by casting kids who had learning differences, they workshopped the, the scripts with us. They brought their own ideas. And every video says, you know, everyone in this video has dyslexia. Um, ADHD or other learning differences. So, um, so each video is around five minutes, and they range from themes like, um, uh, you know, confidence, um, growth mindset, which we obviously don't call that. It's more like understanding that you have to appreciate wherever you are and work to get better. Um, mm -hmm. Understanding your strengths, which is a huge one. Um, but we do it all through humor and there's a character named Professor Boom and Professor Boom works in the laboratory with jello brains and he helps to really try to explain <laughs> neurodiversity, you know, wow. um, because if kids can learn this when they're young, if you mm -hmm. can understand and internalize these ideas, you really will grow up with a sense of your learning difference in a different way than if you're someone who maybe does get the intervention such that you do become able to read and you know you even excel because you know so many kids with LD are super smart and are going to do great in the world but you can still walk around with a lot of sense of baggage and stigma and shame so that's what Super Devil focuses on and we've created a curriculum so 
it was very important to me to not just make fun videos that would be watched on YouTube. It was very much about, I want the kids to be in a situation where they watch the video. And this came from research, obviously, not just my ideas. Um, so they watch a video and then there's a whole lesson plan for the adult who is with them um, to supervise that there's a discussion based on mm -hmm. the theme. And then after the discussion, an activity is introduced and they're usually hands-on um, kind of art-based. Some are, you know, very much can be, they all can be done as a group. Um, they can be, um, you know, one of them, for instance, when the professor boom one about the brain, the activity is that you fill in a, a template of a brain with your strengths and you can draw it in any way you want. It's just a fun, you know, collage or however you want to do it to show what are your strengths. Um, so, the idea is that by doing those three steps, the child can really revisit the theme in all these different ways and, in, and learn how to speak about it and then internalize it to their own particular views. And then each video has four activities. So the idea is that the curriculum, there are 12 videos, it can run for a year, depending on how a teacher or parent or whoever's gonna really be in charge wants to do it. But the kids love the videos. They're funny, they're short, they're, and they like to watch them again and they get different things out of them. And so each time they watch them, we focus on a different element, a different part of the theme and give this discussion, you know, a different bent and then another activity. And that means that each time they're being able to internalize it even deeper. And the repetition is important because, you know, you're learning things that you would otherwise not maybe think about, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not gonna be, learn by one time, you know, it, it, they're, they're subtle, they're subtle themes. Like for instance, um, helping kids have a sense of belonging, you know, that they really, you know, that they're not alone, that they're not the only one. I mean, those okay. are just words. If you don't actually really try to help kids, you know, experience those in, in, in a consistent way, it, it can't happen once a, uh, every six months, they need to hear this and, and internalize it. So, um, you know, we, as I said, focus on things like learning goals, resilience, um, which all of you who are parents of kids with LD know that, you know, our kids tend to have resilience, but they can also get fed up and frustrated and want to give up. And so how do we, you know, help them strengthen that muscle? Um, right. And uh, also identifying their emotions. And we then yes. focus specifically on anxiety because so many kids in the culture that they're having to grow up in, in our society and all over, um, you know, both get frustrated, get angry, but then they also, this, this uh, emotion of anxiety. Mm -hmm. is huge. Um, so we have an episode, which was actually named by one of the kids who we were testing in a school and I let, um, called stress mess. And, um, you know, but, you know, the stress that our, kids in elementary school feel, all kids, not just kids with LD, is insane, right? Mm -hmm. And they're under, you know, so much pressure in, de in different ways. So we want to help them name it, you know, mm -hmm. and help them um, really uh, be able to sort of both advocate about it if they feel that there's something a grown up or a teacher could do, but also understand it for themselves. Um, and, so that's really, I hope that explains it. We just translated all the episodes into Spanish as well as the curriculum. So we're really excited about that because one of our priorities is to get Super Devo out to any child who needs it. You know, I mean, it is an issue that it is hard, it seems, to break a, a, into communities of color and to, um, you know, underserved communities. So that is one of our big missions at Super Devo. Um, that's that's awesome. Yes, and it is very difficult, I find as well. Um, I love I love everything that you just said. I especially want to like talk about this last one that you brought up, the emotion piece, because that's such a difficult thing. Because being able to talk to your emotions also comes with aging. You know, the social emotional development that just comes with growing up, right? It's not like a two year old can't tell you why they're having a temper tantrum, but a seven-year-old can probably give you more 
words to sort of explain what they're feeling. Um, I know with my son, you know, and there's a lot of generational things too. We all, we've all grown up in different generations. So, you know, I was raised by a generation that you don't speak back to your parents. If your parents are mad at you, you stand there and you take it <laughs> and you don't say a single word. Sorry, mom and dad. But <laughs> so I know for me, anger was something that I learned how to verbalize as an adult, not as a child. You know, I always thought if I was angry, then I must be doing something wrong. I, you know, had to be wrong. It was, you know, I wasn't allowed to be angry, but of course I experienced anger. So as an adult, I learned how to talk about I'm mad and here's why I'm mad. And so with my son, you know, of course you get the little two-year-old, you know, like beating against you sort of a thing. And I would tell him, you, you are allowed to be mad at me. That is okay. But you are not allowed to mistreat me. Mm -hmm. Find your words and let's talk about why you're angry. And I've always said that to him. And that's been such an amazing, for him at least, tool to talk through and tell me why he's upset. Well, it is. I mean, you were doing, I think, a big piece of the beginning of social emotional learning. I mean, mm -hmm. identifying your emotions. And, you know, the studies have shown there's no time that's too soon to start right. doing that with a child, um, naming things, being mm -hmm. able to name it. And, um, you know, it's been, for instance, we have an episode called Procrastination. And it was actually written by one of the kids <laughs> in the past who has ADHD and he came to me and he's super brilliant. And he just said, can I maybe try writing one, an episode? And we were still shooting. And so I said, sure. So he brought it in and it was so good. And I said to the other kids in the cast, like, would you be up to learning some more lines? Like we could probably squeeze this into the schedule. And they read it and they said, oh my God, of course. I mean, we can't believe Ari wrote this. And I mean, we tried to be true to it. And honestly, we probably uh, could have made it a little more focused. Um, but the truth, what's very wonderful about it is that the group of kids in the story are trying to help him name what he's doing mm -hmm. when he procrastinates. And that it's not all bad. Some of what right. he sometimes does is because he's just distracted and he goes and he puts together a whole puzzle in like five minutes because he's good at puzzles. And what he's procrastinating about is reading, which is hard for him. So just by breaking it down and beginning to name the, you know, a complex concept, right? As adults yeah. struggle with it. Um, there's no doubt that that begins to help anybody. Uh, right. So it's been really exciting to see that, you know, when we created this, the goal was very much to say, this is needed in the community of kids who have learning differences. And I like mm -hmm. to use the word differences. I know we have to say learning disabilities to get IEPs, but um, uh, <laughs> anyway, LD. So, you know, we actually, there's an organization called CASEL, um, which is the collaboration of applied social emotional learning. And they've been around for 20 years and they identified, you know, a sort of pinwheel with what were the key five points. But the researchers who have been focusing on, okay, let's look at social emotional learning in the lives of kids with LD have actually identified some other points beyond that are considered even, you know, more critical for a struggling learner. Mm -hmm. But what happened when we started to pilot our curriculum, which was based on these more LD themes, is of course they're relevant to all kids. Yeah. And we found schools saying, well, we're actually piling, piling this in general ed, you know? And that mm -hmm. was really thrilling to me because one of the things that then can happen with our Super D episodes is that because the kids in the episodes are LD and it's, you know, made clear, the teachers were saying to us, well, look, we're basically creating empathy in the general ed classroom because they look at these kids and they realize, wow, they're not that different in so many ways than we are. And, you know, we thought that they were this or that, but that was wrong. So that breaks down stigma. So it ends up just, you know, doing these things by the way we actually went about it. 
-hmm. But it is still very much that we are marketing it and saying to all of you out there that you know, we hope you'll take a look. Super Devil is for free until the end of the year. I have to admit that was not intentionally what we were going to do when we launched last March. Um, we need to become self-sustaining so that we can make more episodes. I mean, mm -hmm. we want to make them for middle schoolers. We would like to make them for, you know, younger first and second graders. Um, and, you know, people have asked us already, when is the middle school coming? When is high school coming? So, but we launched in March and the right. schools were in chaos and we were a new kid on the block. And we just felt like, you know, what's most important is that this is a, it can be completely accessed online. It, you know, it can also be done in a classroom where you do the activities in person, but you can do it all online. And so we've got to get this out there and we've got to get people using it during um, the pandemic. So luckily we had some funders you know, because that's how we've existed so far, um, who stepped up and gave us enough funding to just sort of keep afloat and offer everything for free. So anyone who's watching this, go on to superbeville.com, it's one word, and just subscribe. And you can look at what's there. And um, we've organized it, you know, so that um, we're, we're launched, the new site should be up in about, oh, week and a half and that will be organized where there's the option to pick episodes by theme or you can just go in the order that we've decided you know by working with that you know our researchers is a good order to build off of you know to start with for instance the ones where you um basically have self-acceptance so that's probably logical to a lot of you that when your kid first is understanding that they have something what do you want to help them understand? You know, having dyslexia doesn't mean you're stupid. It's not doesn't mean you're less than. It doesn't mean, you know, you, but you do have to accept it. You have to accept that your mind is going to work differently and let's learn to understand it. So we sort of start with that concept of self-acceptance, but, but it might be that what your kid is going through is just total anxiety and stress and what you want to show or your class um, is the ones that are about anxiety <laughs> and touch on that. So we've tried to make it somewhat flexible um, in that respect. And uh, what is the, so you said you're gonna make them for middle schoolers and you also said targeting first and second graders. So is the age range primarily third right through fifth? Now we, we say it's seven to 12 year olds because we have had people use it with those ages. Mm -hmm. I would say that seven is a little on the young side. I think it's third, fourth, and fifth graders are the key age. And, and why that is where we started is because many of you might have already experienced this is that that's when the, our kids start really noticing, yeah. right? That they're, you know, that it's no longer just that, oh, maybe I'm just a little slow at learning this. It starts to become this isn't going away, something's gonna have to, you know, it's so much starts getting layered on in that age. And the kids are, you know, at a point, I think developmentally where they're very self-aware about mm -hmm. themselves in terms of their peers. It's just beginning, you know, they're not the center of the universe as much as they were when they were in kindergarten and first grade, which sort of can protect them in some ways. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what we really targeted on. But I mean, there are sixth graders who also, you know, watch them and, um, you know, can still get stuff out of it. After that, it starts feeling babyish. I mean, I think that they're, you know, the kids are young yeah. and older kids are, you know, not going to, um, they don't look at it as re relating to them, even though the themes probably do, but it would have to be done with older kids and, mm -hmm. and be done in, with different emphasis. Um, mm -hmm. but that is a, that is our goal and our plan, but, you know, we're starting with this pilot obviously and getting these out there and, and it's really been all, you know, because we started as a scrappy new company without, with the pandemic, it's really been word of mouth and social media, but all of the organizations like Dyslexia Initiative, Decoding Dyslexia, I mean, without all of you, I don't quite know what would have happened. And it just makes me, that is something that I can bring perspective to as someone who had dyslexia in the early 60s. And I don't think my mother ever talked to anyone living soul about it, except 
her mother who was in the field, you know? Right. I mean, there was no way, there were no organizations, there was nothing, there was no extra time. There was, you know, it was just so different. And um, so as frustrated as we all, I think, can feel at times that, you know, laws need to change and things still need to happen, there at least has been that. Mm -hmm. There has been a groundswell, right? Of, I don't want to say only moms, but I think a lot of moms and it's thrilling if you're me, you know, and have lived another reality, you know, in, I mean, a reality that is what inspired me to do this project was that I still, you know, 10 years ago met with other adult dyslexics in a setting and we all had so much baggage. We all have the same nightmares still. We all still felt stigma and shame. We all still, and I was just like, whoa, we cannot let another generation of kids grow up with this. Right. It, we can't. Um, and luckily there are other organizations like Eye to Eye, which um, I always like to give a pitch for, you know, that if you're lucky enough to be in a school that has their program, you know, it's wonderful. Um, but I think what is, I think exciting about Super Devil is that because it's accessible on the web, we can literally get to any school anywhere. Right. And if you're a tiny school in New Mexico and you happen to hear about us today, please go on and look into it. And, you know, we, we are accessible and have created everything in the one portal. You can download the lesson plans. We've put the lesson plans into eight languages so that parents can also have access to doing this with their kids at home. Um, and that's been an interesting byproduct of the pandemic, honestly, which is we never thought about that angle necessarily. Mm -hmm. We saw this as this should be you know, done at school because the kids are a captive audience and parents are pretty beleaguered, you know, and why add yes. something else onto the parents' plate, right? To find time to do this. But what we found that some teachers or guidance counselors have been doing is that they do the video and the discussion on Zoom, and then they send the activity home as homework. And they have the parent watch the video with the child and that allows that triangle of the school and the parent and the child all to be sort of on the same page about what some of these issues are, you know, and gets the child to open up not only in the classroom, but to their parent maybe about what they're feeling or, um, and, but we felt like there are parents where this lesson plan in English could be challenging, you know, and we want them to be able to access it and feel comfortable and feel included. So we've really tried to make this this inclusive a curriculum as possible because we all know that one in five kids has dyslexia and it crosses every division or you know it's every any child you know from any community so we need to reach everybody i just am like kind of obsessed with that notion <laughs> i think it's a good thing to be obsessed with though yeah yeah so let's talk about social emotional learning because I, I know as a parent that that's a term that's thrown out a lot from the educational establishment. And in some of the context in which it's thrown out, I know that I have bristled against it because I'm sitting here going, you're not responsible for teaching that to my child. I'm responsible for teaching that to my child. And I don't know that the way that you would teach it versus the way that I would teach it would be aligned from you know a family philosophy sort of sort of way, right? That is so interesting to hear you bring that up because I've heard that the flip way mm. where educators feel, you know, I'm from New York City, major school system with, you know, many, many issues and, um, and teachers are on the front lines. And, um, and, you know, there are educators who feel this is not the purview of schools. I mean, we don't have time to add this in and what's really, it should be done at home, right? Now, what CASEL, the organization I mentioned to you and other people have done over the past 20 years is that they've done studies, longitudinal studies where they've shown that by 
doing the basic social emotional learning, which really I think you can think of as not being embedded with huge values. You know, it's not, these are basically whole child common sense notions, you know? Right. They're how we would want to treat anyone. It's like how it, treat others the way you would want to be treated. I mean, so have empathy because you would want someone to be empathetic to you, you know? Understand how you're gonna deal with a social interaction and your um, sense of your emotions, like being angry, because it's going to help you navigate the world. I mean, it's really simple kind of concepts, mm -hmm. right? And so in the studies, they've shown that kids actually do 11% better academically when they're exposed to just these basic notions, all right? And, um, and then there are sort of bigger societal benefits that they've been able to show, which is that, you know, in terms of employment, in terms of all kinds of things, right? So I would say to all of us as parents who are worried, you know, because we're usually just worried, I mean, from the minute our kids start struggling, right? I mean, it's really hard. Like we're, are they gonna get the right intervention? Are they going to get it fast enough? Are they, are they going to feel good about themselves along the way, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what social emotional learning, and, and I do believe like what Super Devil tries to do is make it accessible for home and school. So, I mean, you could decide to take it on and do it at home. But is that our kids want to find a way to feel better about themselves. They want to feel they can belong in a community where it's okay to talk about the you know frustrations or the issues that they feel. Mm -hmm. um, and that you know if we don't let that happen at school, they are going to inevitably have to bury and squash and feel more isolated. So I kind of think that your reaction that you were describing is completely natural because number one, we're all bringing a certain level of worry, you know, mm -hmm. to how to bring our child to the next step, you know, and feel good about it. Um, and along the way, you know, they're going to be hiccups no matter what. But, but I think that you have to look at it just the way Marianne Wolf talks about it, which is you cannot assume that these things just happen. Right. And that a child is not going to develop a sense of, I mean, here's an example. We have an episode that's called Never Give Up. And it's a child, and it's based on a true story of uh, one of the writers who every, a lot of the people who work, everyone who worked on the project creatively was dyslexic. So we brought um, some real experiences to this. And so, you know, it's a classic example. I think so many of us have had this conversation with our child where um, the, the series is set around a clubhouse and the kids come after school or wherever, you know, you know, and it's where they get to sort of share and unburden themselves with each other and get support. And he walks in and um, crumples up a piece of paper. He's upset because he got only a six out of 10 on a spelling test. And the kids all say, but didn't you get a five last time? I mean, that's great. Like you got one point more. He said, yeah, but I mean, the other kids, they don't even work as hard and they're getting eights and nines. And I just, you know, because he was comparing himself to them rather than comparing himself to what he had done before and the improvement. And so the kids are the ones who talk to him about it. Mm. I mean, that's frankly the beauty I think of what Super Devil is, is that the kids mentor each other. Mm -hmm. So it isn't even that it's a parent. It, it, the peer mentoring is how kids hear this. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. And so it's through that conversation that the, you know, this little boy is able to start to think, oh, all right, so it's that I just have to keep working at it because that's what the friends are saying. You know, you're improving, feel good about that. We all know that if as a parent, sometimes if you say that to your child, they'll just roll their eyes. They'll like, you don't get it, mom. You know, you just don't get how I feel. But if a peer says that to you, that has a lot of impact. So I think that's the way to think of it is that, None of this should happen only in one place. 
it's a co it's a collaborative experience you know right. it needs to happen in multiple places different levels and um and we have to embrace the idea that just as learning to read is not a natural experience if you're having understanding neurodiversity let's put it that way in an environment where we are sent to school and everyone assumes that most kids are normal okay that's the reality we live in a society where we're supposed to have normal kids and so as parents from the minute we start noticing wait a minute you know is my kid what's wrong you know or all that there's just so many layers of emotions and so many things that come up and and so i'm just being the voice of let's take that part as seriously as we do finding the right you know whether it's wilson or barton like all the work we'll do to make sure that our child is going to get the right intervention that fits their needs let's also do that about okay what are the areas that my child seems to be struggling with the most is it um, self-acceptance? Is it resilience? Is it um, that they feel alone? They like they're in the end, the only one. Um, and let's work on that. Let's not assume that they're just going to figure it out, you know, because how would they figure it out on their own? Right. That's, a, that's an impossible tall order. Um, so that's the way I look at it. And I think that probably Marianne could even explain it in a scientific way, you know, which is that the repetition of getting some of these things brought into your neuro, you know, your uh, neuro system, your endocrine system helps you to think differently, like the narrative that you're saying to yourself of, well, I do it differently, so I must be stupid, right? I mean, how often do we hear that in the beginning, you know? Mm -hmm. um, why do I never get that I can spell anything right or you know whatever it is to change that narrative in the, a child's own head takes repetition it does they're not going to just take your word for it you know so that's what we've created i mean every activity for instance we have these little flash of things that come up and says uh thinking thinking differently is thinking smart you know well in the course of doing the super deville curriculum a child's going to hear that about 50 times. I mean, you know, there's just a lot of repetition of some of those things. Mm -hmm. Well, and to the point that I was making, I think that there's a, I think that there's a use of buzzwords sometimes within education that don't come with explanation. Right. And so I like how you're talking about Castle and what you're trying to do with Super Deville and how you're focusing on specific pieces because that is critical and I think we need to be talking a lot more as a society you know out there with each other than we do on many of these topics anxiety depression um there's 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 so much that we do need to be talking about so I I love the idea of it being in the school as more of a generalized lessons because it can create more conversation at home as well right. Right, in both places. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I have the little microcosm of the cast who I got to work with. And I mean, we, we ended up, honestly, when I did the casting call, I thought that I'd be lucky to have 10 kids show up because the criteria was that they had to be willing to be public about having a learning difference because it was going to, you know, be put out there on, you know, um, on the web. And a hundred kids auditioned. And that was a sign of big change, I think. Yeah. And some of that, a lot of that is probably because they had families and parents who were beginning, you know, from the beginning, you know, starting to say, yes, you have dyslexia or ADHD, but um, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. And, you know, so they were beginning to, and they, those parents were the ones who saw that, I think the casting call um, flyers and were like, oh, this would be great for my child. I'd love them to have an opportunity like this. So, I mean, I would say many of the kids were dragged to the audition, <laughs> but luckily the other criteria was that they had to love to perform, you know, and I didn't have to have experience. So I end up getting to cast this wonderful group of kids. And because we've done a lot of research along the way and piloted this and tested it, um, it took us six years 
you know, and so I started with kids who were in fourth and fifth grade. There's two kids who I just wrote college recommendations for and are going to college. So um, they've lived this message and gone out there and done interviews and, you know, been on Fox News. And I mean, it's incredible, you know, that what, because to me, often it's been, you want to do an interview about this? Come talk to the kids. You know, really, they're the ones that are amazingly articulate about why they wanted to do this, why they wanted to help other kids, why they wanted to make sure other kids didn't feel stupid or alone. And I think that they are the, they're the crusaders. They're the new, the generation I hoped that we can create that will go out there and stand up and speak up and, and, and help each other. Um, so I think that, you know, that's what's, can happen if you have this kind of curriculum discussion. I personally jumped on the social emotional learning bandwagon, to be honest. It wasn't really the name that I was in my head when I started this. What I started was I want you as a mom to be able to come home potentially at an end, you know, at the end of the day where your son might just be demoralized, right? Like, just feel like I can't do this again. You know, I'm just so tired and be able to turn on one of these videos, watch it together, laugh because they're all a little bit funny. And then, you know, look at the discussion guide and talk about it and have mm -hmm. some real experts having helped you guide you where to go. Right. Um, and so that's really what was the, the inspiration for doing this. And then as I got to work with such great minds in the sort of research field, you know, I got to learn, wow, this really fits in to a place in the schools and we should get it in there. Um, but it also can be used, you know, at home or with a tutor or um, in various after school settings or, you know, different ways. And I'd like to just um, bring up one quick thing, which is, our head of outreach um, was doing research on social media and in December, January noticed how many parents were saying, oh my goodness, my child feels so isolated. You know, Zoom learning is so hard for kids with LD, particularly yes. hard, right? They're not even getting to do the fun things that are the after school or extracurricular that can make them feel better about themselves. And so she started something called Super D Friends. And the idea was just to have some place on using Zoom where kids could come and chat and you know make it fun, show an episode, talk, show their favorite pet, show their, you know, it didn't have to, I mean, it, it, they're very relaxed, 45, they seem to go on to an hour often. So she started with just one and she got hundreds of people signing up. And so now it's five days a week. She's trained a whole bunch of mentors. Um, and uh -oh. Is this me or is it Peggy? I'm hoping it's not me. Hello, can somebody text me and tell me if it's just me? Oh, there you are. I lost you for a second. I didn't know if it was you or if it was me. <laughs> Oh, I'm here. I think okay. it just says, yeah, the connection is unstable. Anyway, Super D Friends is an, a, a resource. It's a uh, donation based, you know, non, it can be free if you can't afford it. It's amazing how it's taken off. The, 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 the sessions are the most touching thing ever. Um, we're happy to have, you know, people can check it out if they want to see if it's something right for their child. Um, but uh, I think particularly during this time, it's turning out to be something that gives kids a feeling of belonging. And what's particularly cool is that they don't have to kind of go back to school and see these kids. They're meeting kids from all over the country. I mean, in one group, there'll be a kid from Canada, Fargo, Alaska, you know, Georgia, and, um, I don't know. It's a it's a weird silver lining is a strong statement to say related to the pandemic. But the but the fact of the kids being so comfortable with Zoom, mm -hmm. you know, that for them it's just like oh yeah, they just get right down to it. But it's led by a mentor who has LD, 
So, you know, the, the, the leader is guiding, relating, making sure that it's safe. And so um, we would love, love people to check this out. You can look on our Facebook page. Um, starting in about a week, the signups for it will also be on our site. Um, and it really is just something we want to offer kids right now because mm -hmm. it feels like it's helping. It's yeah. needed you know, and it's for seven to 12 year olds. I mean, we've gotten requests to do it for older kids, but we don't have videos for older kids. And I think older kids might take to it differently. I mean, I think the seven to 12 year olds are the perfect age group for this because mm -hmm. they're kind of uninhibited. And I don't know, it's just been, it, it, it's, I never, I don't lead them. I just have listened in um, when uh, some of them are done and I keep an eye on them. And I am just blown away by how these kids want to help each other and talk to each other and share. And um, so I'm just putting the word out about that as well. Well, seven to 12 is such a good window too, to, to be able to set the framework for the more difficult junior high and high school years, especially the junior high years, which can be sort of emotionally fraught, if right. you will. Right. You know, the more capable you are of sort of talking about what your emotions are or recognizing what they are and standing up for yourself too is, is an important aspect, I think, of self-advocacy as well. Absolutely. And, um, and I think right now, you know, so many kids have lost some of the benefits that they had, you know, with whatever interventions they were having at school um, because they're not getting the same kind of support and it's falling a lot on parents. So, I mean, we've been asked to actually do parent groups too, but, um, you know, we, I just want to really make sure that these groups are working and kids are getting what they need um, because let's hope by next year we're, you know, they're back in school. <laughs> let's hope. Yes, um, please. Let's hope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can't keep doing this indefinitely. <laughs> Right, right. It's like everybody else can't. Um, so we had one question come in, or we've had many comments and many questions, but um, I did want to get this one question. Of, you mentioned that it would be free through this year, so 2021. When you do start to charge for it, what do you think? I mean, will you do a different pay for parents than you will for yes. school? Oh, and what? Yes. How do you, how do you, how will you <laughs> set that fee structure? What, what do y'all, I mean, and that's a long way off. You may not know yet, but what do you, what do you oh, think? Yeah. I have to be honest, I, think, I can't give exacts. And partly because we are talking to someone about partnering um, with distribution, because honestly, I mean, I'm a dyslexic who became a filmmaker and my skill set is really making films and making the content. And I never wanted to become also a company that was a distributor, you know, because that in itself is a huge job you know, and especially with public schools, which is really where we want to get this um, mm -hmm. and, and homeschoolers, you know, but we want to really get it out there to the communities that don't have a lot of resources. So, um, so we are talking to a company and cross fingers and toes that that works. Um, um, and so then it, the, the pricing will be set, you know, in conjunction with them, mm -hmm. but we are not pricing this for schools or districts at a super high price, number one because it's not part of the core curriculum. It is an extra. And so, you know, it really will be affordable for schools, mm -hmm. but it will be much less if an individual or a homeschooler or a tutor or anybody um, in, you know, is working one-to-one -one or in a very small group. And ideally we are also applying for some funding. And if we could get to the position where we could offer it for free to everyone but schools, I would be very happy. I mean, that would be a goal of mine mm -hmm. because I feel like the schools should pay for it, you know, mm -hmm. because they can, they have budgets and they are spending money on social emotional learning. I mean, that's become like, a, as you said, it's one of the new catchphrases, right? Right. It's thrown around a lot. So I feel like, yeah, you should be doing something specifically for the kids who have learning differences and be focusing on that. Um, but if I could make it so that it was accessible to individuals, but whatever we do, we will make it as affordable and sliding scale or, you know, I mean, that's the goal. That really is the goal. That would be, that would be awesome. So we've been running for about an hour and I know your family really wanted your attention today. 
<laughs> yeah, that's all right. They, my family really was yesterday. I had a great birthday. So okay. today, so today I, I think everyone's tired of each other. We're fine. Okay, okay good. <laughs> but, um, and you said there are 10 videos right now? There are 12 videos. 12. Um, and each video has four activities. So okay. that's why it's quite robust. Um, and uh, we're adding on to the website also, um, there are videos that are called Super D Tips and they're kids in the cast talking directly to the camera. But really what they're doing is trying to just talk directly to your child and they give tips on all kinds of things like mm -hmm. how to speak up to your, uh, one little girl talks about having to talk to her swim coach about how he was expecting her to do something with counting that she couldn't do in her head and how mm -hmm. she had to explain to him and work out something. And it's just so, I mean, she's in fourth grade and she's so articulate about it. And, and I think those are the kinds of little things that peer to peer getting advice. And, you know, all of a sudden your child can go, oh, that's true. I've really been wanting to speak up about that, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't even want to tell my parents. Um, so we have, those resources are going to be on the site as well, which will, are all free. I mean, we'll all, that kind of stuff will always be free. So, um, awesome. yeah, yeah. And, and we have one thing we've been, I mean, it'll be fun to get more feedback as people sign up and we can, um, you know, I, I think that we really see this as growing where the community can also send us ideas for episodes. I mean, as parents, you know what your kids are facing. I mean, you're some of our best resource. Um, so please, you know, you can contact us at questions at superdeville.com. That's mm -hmm. the best way to get in touch. And you can see that also on the site. And you can also go on to um, superdeville.com and sign up for our newsletter, which is called the Super D Digest. And we send that out, um, you know, at least twice a month. And ultimately we hope that will become quite a community building, um, you know, where, both teachers or families will be sharing things that their kids have created doing the curriculum, ideas for ways to expand activities. Um, so, but I mean, really this, this project is really a community endeavor, you know, yeah. it's strength really will grow from that. So I just can't stress that enough of how much we would love to hear feedback. And that can be, you know, just hearing what you said about, you know, there's a part of me that feels like, well, SEL, you know, maybe I just want that to be something that I do at home. I mean, hearing those things is so helpful because it can help us know how do we want to talk about this? How, how can we help you more feel comfortable? Um, yeah. Well, and from, from my perspective on that, it's I want them to be more transparent with me. I don't want them to say, yeah. oh, we're doing social emotional learning on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And you have absolutely no idea what that means. Right. Exactly, exactly. And what does social emotional learning mean anyway? I mean, right. obviously, um, on the site, we actually have three um, Melissa Orkin, Dr. Melissa Orkin, who's one of the, you know, advisors on the project, we have three videos of um, different experts talking about what social emotional learning is. So that's also a resource on our site, because we felt that too. It's mm -hmm. like, this is just another catchphrase. I mean, right. is this going to be gone in five years? Right. <laughs> no, it'll, I mean, and because the needs of our kids are not going to be gone. You know? Right. And are you instilling ideals that I don't necessarily agree with as a person or, you know, what? What? Well, so, well Super Devil is totally transparent. So <laughs> and I love that. <laughs> you, know, right? you see what the themes are. You see descriptions of what the episodes are. Mm -hmm. You can preview everything before your child would ever see it. Um, awesome. So I personally, and maybe created it that way because I had a little bit of your feeling, you know, <laughs> that we spend so much time, I think, being thrust into the role of championing our child and helping our child that it is hard to let go. And maybe we don't want to let go without really knowing what is involved. Um, right. I understand that. I think that that's, um, but I, I think that one of the things um, that I've seen and why I love the idea of the sort of peer to peer and the mentoring side of things is that 
I think that the kids are remarkable at helping each other, you know? And, and I mean, we got, you know, we showed these scripts to teachers and there was, there's some bullying in one of the scripts and then it turns out all well, obviously. And somebody said, well, we don't think it's good that you're modeling bullying, you know, that you're showing bullying. And we were like, but bullying exists. Right. You've got to talk to the, if you talk to these children, they've all been bullied. I mean, in one way or another, verbal bullying, teasing, mm -hmm. they face this. What, we're going to make an entire series that's supposed to be about their lives and never, ever show that? That's right. not authentic. I mean, right. they're not stupid. <laughs> you know, they're going to go, excuse me, this is not really like what our lives are. This is way nicer. Or, and so we, you know, there were moments where we had to make those choices that there are going to be maybe parents or teachers who don't want, who don't like that. You know, but um, I think in this particular episode, the bullying turns very quickly, and you know, the the story has the effect of helping the kids the, who were doing the bullying too. Mm -hmm. But um, that those were some of the choices we had to make along the way, and I can see that there could be people who would disagree with that. You know, that we went that route, but we we went. Listen, our audience had to be the kids, right? The kids had to want to watch these, right? Not feel like they were being given horrible cough syrup, you know. <laughs> I mean, they had to want to watch them and enjoy them and think that they were, and not also be told, "Oh, this will be fun," you know, which is the kiss of death, right? Right. Um, they so really paramount that was a goal for us is that the kids would think this was something worth watching, um, and from there the rest then. He froze again. <laughs> Hopefully you come back in a second. I love everything that she's saying. I get to talk. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, you're back. Yay. So <laughs> you froze for a second. <laughs> Sorry. So I was going to say, but I think that you hit the nail on the head because too often children are spoke at instead of two and to create something that is authentic for them is always going to generate a better response out of them right you know and i i know with my you know 12 year old going on 17 teenage angst child you know, <laughs> we we have a lot of discussions about those talking to at versus talking to right and he hates to be spoken at absolutely you know, he, he in, disengages quickly and he, you know, and it, he'll look at me and go, no, you don't understand mom because you're not dyslexic. So stop talking to me like you think you understand. And I'm like, you're right. Tell me so that I can relate so that I can help, you know, let's, let's have that conversation. He's like, okay. You know, when he knows he's going to be heard versus, you know, if I fall too down, too far down the advocacy hole and He's like, exactly, exactly. Hold on, you that, know? That's the complicated thing with the whole thing about dyslexic strengths and mm -hmm. superpowers. And some of the kids in the cast, like oh, one of the kids is so funny. And he said one day, he said, if one more person tells me that Einstein was dyslexic or so-and-so was dyslexic, I mean, how does that help me? Exactly. I'm not, I mean, I, I, I just want to be able to get tall enough to play on the football team. <laughs> and I felt like, oh, I love you. You know, that was just such a true and honest statement because I mean, I think all children have gifts. I mean, let's be honest. That's how we should be thinking about our children is that everyone has strengths. Um, mm -hmm. It might be that you're good at taking apart cars, you know, or um, I mean, one friend of my son's who turned out to have learning differences and was very ADD. We always knew when he'd been over at our house starting at age like five, because the fax machine wires would be taken or like everything <laughs> but he was brilliant at it i mean it, you know he didn't learn to read for i don't know how long but this child you could say could you come and just fix the wiring behind my tv um so i mean that idea that kids have strengths is wonderful mm -hmm. but the idea that they have superpowers and that they are going to find this like extraordinary strength is a lot of pressure on our mm -hmm. kids 
And I, I mean, I don't know how you feel about that. I mean, I just feel we have to be very careful with the language. I, I, the I agree. Pick, the kids pick up on it. So one of, one of my two partners, Shantae, I don't know if you watched um, Jake's live with myself and Julie and Shantae. It's the only time the three of us have been live together. Yes. <laughs> But Shantae is the dyslexic one out of three of us. And I think it was it pretty I, it was before the pandemic hit. So it's been at least a year. She wrote a blog piece on that's on our website called Pretty Little Dyslexia Lies. Mm. And she, you know, and she, but she talks about the quote, you know, Einstein, you know, allegedly said, you know, if a fish Right. If you ask a fish to climb a tree, then the fish is always going to fail or however that quote goes. Einstein actually never said that. And, you know, she talks about lots of lots of quotes that have sort of ended up in our community that aren't actually true quotes or that were lifting these people up on the platform going, look, they're dyslexic. Look, they're dyslexic. Look, they're dyslexic. And, you know, so many people are like, yeah, but I'm not I'm not going to be that person so are you telling me that I have to be that she talks about that pressure about that that stigma of or not stigma stigma it's is not a, it's a it's a reverse pressure it's coming out of a good place I it mean, is it's I coming out of love it's coming out of love but I also think it's coming out of a little bit that our society has been so rigid mm -hmm. about accepting neurodiversity Yes. And it almost became like, well, if we don't start to really show the amazing gifts of people with dyslexia, no one is going to listen. No one is going to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And I think that was sort of, it was like this pendulum swing thing. So it makes sense. You know, you do want to say, everybody stop ignoring this part of the population because they have a huge amount to contribute to our society. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, Richard Branson, has spoken about that a lot. And, um, you know, it, it, the organization that he's um, part of in England, and I've literally just had a made by dyslexia, by dyslexia, those concepts are dyslexic advantage. They all come out of that important advocacy piece of like, come on, we are ignoring a, a hugely important part of our population that can really contribute, right? right. But in an ideal world, we'd be saying everyone can contribute. You know, that's the society we want to be in and believe in. And right. so, you know, you don't have to say pay attention because they can contribute because that's obvious. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I, and then the rest is, yes, everyone should understand their strengths. I mean, right. you're going to do better in life and make choices about how you spend your time and what you're going to be productive at and how you're going to then also hopefully make a living and be happy the more you choose based upon what your strengths are and it's just right. logical and alice shava shorts and i talked about that on our podcast a couple of years ago and um, and she was you know she asked she asked a really powerful question of what if you're struggling finding your strengths yeah and you know my response to that was I think as a society, we put way too much emphasis, especially on children, of trying to identify your strengths. I always hated the question, well, what are you going to be when you grow up, Ashley? Right. Right. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't figure out what I wanted to do with my life until I was in my 40s and my son hit the dyslexia wall. I'm a good employee. I'm good at what I do, you know, and I've got a certain amount of passion about that, but is that what I want to do for my whole life? I don't know. What I know that I have skill, significant skill at is advocacy. And I've got passion and heart and fire for that. That's a strength that I found in my forties. Right. So, you know, the, I think our strengths as people come out at different times Absolutely. Different Absolutely. things, different impetus, different experiences. Trauma can generate strength, you know. But I would maintain that when you're dyslexic mm -hmm. as a child in school, and by and large, all the emphasis is being 
placed on your weaknesses, you know, what you can't do. Right. So you're getting the red circle around every word that you're spelling incorrectly, you know, right. that the reason that, you know, and I think the question of, well, what if you can't find your strengths for the dyslexic community, at least, or the LD community, I would maintain that that's why it's important to just be discussing all of this because right. it's not about finding it, sticking to it and it being the thing that is what you do the rest of your life. It's the fact that you're just asking the question and not accepting that the red marks on the page define you. Right. That's really what it's about. It's really about, okay, this is a process and I'm not gonna get defined by you know this, you know, and so now we talk about um, strength-based learning, right? You know, right. And, that, and and I would say that as someone with LD, you know, I wished I'd had more teachers who had known that notion, you know, Absolutely. I think they would have taught me in different ways. They would have realized, like my tutor did, that I love to tell stories or, you know, for me, let me go watch a movie about, you know, the French Revolution. And chances are, I'll tell you a whole lot more than if you give me some dense text with dates and facts and names that I'll spend all my time trying to memorize and I'll forget the next day, you know? So I think that it's that kind of thing. It's just what's even your inclination, what kind of learner are you? That could also be the same part of your strengths. Like, are you a visual learner? Are you a kinesthetic? Mm -hmm. you know? So to me, it's just all of that is just a shift that needs to happen that then allows the child to go, oh, I don't have to fit into this one box. Like, wow, that's right. relief, you know? And I think a lot of that is changing the conversation about what strengths are. Right, exactly, exactly. Because I think as a society, we think of strengths in too narrow of a box. And we have to stop doing that. We have to start thinking of, you know, powerful characteristics as being strengths because they can be. And, right. you know, everything that you just said. And I love that you say, define you, because that was actually the mantra that I gave my son. So every day when I dropped him off at school, in elementary school, I did this for three straight years. He got really tired of me doing it after a while. <laughs> But I would point at that building and I would go, this place and these people do not get to define you. Right. A test is a moment in time that has no measure on who you are as a person or where you're going to go from here. Right. Who you're going to be when you grow up, what you're going to contribute to this world when you grow up. And nobody's going to remember by that point anyway. Right. But it's a place that you're stuck in for you know, unfortunately, 12 years that I can't pull you out of. <laughs> and I mean, imagine, you know, and it still happens in parts of the country. I just pray that it's better um, than it was in my day that you, you know, are in a situation where on top of everything, you're also being told that you're not trying. Yeah. You know, I mean, that that added thing can happen. And I do think that, you know, what we're all pushing and advocating for, right, is the, the individual sort of growth and support that we think our child needs. And then the changes in the discussion and in, if you knew that you were sending your child inside a building where in fact people didn't look at it as um, that intelligence was static, you know, that, that idea that, you know, if, if everything from the beginning was like, oh, well, yes, I know, you know, today's going to be more math and there's some of you who that's not your favorite, but, you know, I promise we'll get back to those things that you love and Peggy, we'll, we'll get back to when you get to have art, you know, don't worry, you'll get it. I mean, if there was just a discussion where it was all equal, like it wasn't like, well, you know, the art is this thing that you get to do once in a while, but it's not even considered important. And, um, you know, I, I just think that there's so many things that need to change to make that building a safe place for kids who learn differently. And, um, and then on, at the same time, you know, I never like to end or any discussion like this without sort of coming back to the importance of things that Marianne Wolf talks about, which is 
we do absolutely need to make a commitment to teach children how they need to learn best. They need yes. to be given the skills and the tools and they, we need to train our teachers. We need to do that. So I bit off something called, you know, social emotional learning without knowing that that it was called that um, because I was a filmmaker and a storyteller and a dyslexic who, you know, just had a lot of heart about this because I was raising a child who had what I had had. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it all is part of the, you know, big puzzle where it has to go along with everything that, you know, Marianne Wolf is talking about or Louisa Motes, or, I mean, I see this as all part of one, you know, important uh, puzzle. And it, mm -hmm. it, you can't have one piece without the other. So I do believe you need the, the, the emotional discussions, the, the so whatever we want to call it to get out of the jargon, but the, the mm -hmm. confidence building and the, and the helping with the resilience along the way that you're getting the decoding help, you know, because having done it myself, flashcards get really hard <laughs> or whatever. I mean, you do notice kids are smart. They know they're having to do something that other kids are not having to do, you know? Right. And um, so you need to address it. You do, and you're spot on because I know that each of my son's tutors, you know, recognize those breaking points with him, you know, and played games right. at, and made deals. Okay, well, we can play this game three times if you can just give me five more minutes of this exercise. I know you're not enjoying, but it's important. You know, will you agree to that? And, and you know, he'd go five times and they'd go four. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, it's fascinating because for me, I have kids who are 20 months apart. And my son did not have dyslexia, but as I mentioned in the beginning, he had anxiety, like real panic attacks as a little mm -hmm. kid. So I learned a lot about how that's a real thing and little kids can really have that and how to help him. And, and he also had to have speech and some other things. And then Emma, his younger sister was the one with dyslexia. Well, what's so fascinating is that Ben, the learning part came easily to him. He taught himself how to read, he was good at math, but what he didn't have is stick to itiveness. It's like, if things got a little harder as the grades got on, or if he wasn't as interested, you know, he would, he would be fine with getting a lesser grade. I mean, he just didn't have that work ethic. And mm -hmm. as time went on, he watched his sister who had to go through, you know, to memorize the states, what she had to do to fill out that map to put in the states. I mean, he couldn't believe what she went through to remember it. And he kind of afterwards said, wow, that's actually really impressive, you know, that you came up with that trick, that game, that whatever. And now they're, you know, 26 and, and 24. And, and it's fascinating the amount of respect he has for her, you know, for what she had to learn to learn, you know, right. and, and, um, and she sometimes I can hear her giving him advice. I mean, you know, I'm like, look, Ben, I think you just sometimes, you know, give yourself a reward. You can think about that, but you need to stick to this. So there's, you know, it's fascinating really. Um, and there are ways that I think our kids who have to go through this can come out at the other end. I mean, that has nothing to do with like the strengths or the whatever. It's just the mere fact that you have to take longer and it is going to, you do learn something about yourself. If you, and especially if it's handled well, you know, right. by people who are empathetic and, and caring and who make you feel that you're not doing this because you're stupid. It's just it's because how your mind is wired, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we'll get there in the end, right? All of us, we will just keep advocating. We will, we have to. <laughs> yeah, and the kids will. I mean, I do think this generation of kids is getting language and, and the kinds of things that you've said to your son when you dropped him off at school and parents across the world. You know, I have to say one amazing thing about Super Devil is it's being launched in India. That a woman in Myanmar discovered it on the web and she is ADHD and runs a virtual reality company and she's taken it and is turning it into a whole curriculum to try to educate the country about learning differences. Oh, wow. Paul, it's being translated. I mean, people are just finding it. 
And mm -hmm. I think it's because it is a universal thing that we know that there are too many kids walking around feeling stupid, you know, just as simple as that. Like we just, if I could do nothing else, but just change that as a starting point. Right. Wow. Right. Wouldn't we all feel better because then that child will be a future advocate. Right. I really believe that. Absolutely. I a hundred percent agree with you. I mean, it's just so true because the word stupid is just so damaging right. as well. And, right. And, Sorry, there's people in the streets and my dogs are going nuts. <laughs> that's okay. My husband must not be at home. <laughs> <laughs> so Peggy, we've been going for a really long time and I think we could keep talking. Oh, this has been like great, but thank you hours. for having me. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you. For having me. Thank you so much for coming on. I mean, this has been amazing. Um, we definitely support Super Dville and anything that the Dyslexia Initiative can do to help get the message out there, please just let us know. Thank you. And so support the work you're doing. So thank it's, you. It's, it's, you know, we'll just all keep at it. And thank you for having me. And stay <laughs> warm. And I hope everything thaws very quickly. Well, I'm in the coldest room in the house, so I am going to run and go get under a couple yeah. of blankets and thaw. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. All right. Well, thank you for doing this in the midst of everything. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay. Bye. We'll talk soon. Yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs>